Welcome everybody again. This will be the second part of uh, this uh, three series uh, lectures. And so the idea today is to dive in into the mathematics of the things that are presented in the first one. Um, so um, I plan today to uh, introduce a bunch of notions um, and maybe try to prove some things um, so we can get to the uh, to the main result I presented in the last talk, I think right in the end. It was sort of an unreadable result, and I'll, I'll try to make it readable. Okay. Okay. Part two. Okay. Use this one. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's start with a bunch of definitions. So the first definition is um, uh, the following. And suppose I give you a function a. So a will be a, uh, so I usually use the, the symbol a to denote the function, a real function from, uh, from the real line to the complex, uh, the complex plane. Um, and we say that, we see that a is locally summable. if the support set of A, just a set of points such that A is non-zero, A of lambda, uh, is countable. And so if, uh, so say that A is locally submitable, so if this is countable, countable, and if you write the support as a, if you get an enumeration of the points in the support, uh, we have that the, uh, once you do this sum, this is finite, okay, for every t positive. Okay, so the support will be contained in a countable uh, sequence of points. So you take any enumeration you like, uh, you, and you do the sum is always finite. Okay, that means that I can do this. So this implies that I can always write this thing. Uh, for every bounded set k contain in the reals. I can perform this, and this number is well defined. It's independent of the, uh, uh, the summation I take, OK? Uh, this is just uh, to, uh, in this series, it's better to think about functions like that than to the equivalent object, which will be, so let me do an observation here. Um, um, you could instead think of A as a measure. So you could think of A, say, you could identify A with a pure point measure. Which would be the sum, you take one enumeration, you put deltas here. You could try to identify A with this measure, OK? It's a pure point measure of delta masses with weights A of lambda n. If lambda n is such a numeration, and you could say you could sort of identify this with the function A, OK? 
So I will flip back and forth. Sometimes I'll think A as a measure, a pure point measure. Sometimes I will think A as a function. Um, and so, yeah, so as I said, a pure point measure is a measure that is something like this, uh, a sum of uh, delta masses, okay? Um, yep, okay. Now let me define um, uh, let me see what I want to define. Uh, yeah, so what are the objects are interested? So the, the kind of objects, uh, so in the, the previous lecture we saw these crystallographic pictures, okay? Uh, they were high dimensional space, but usually, uh, what they meant is that you had some sort of a measure, mu, which was positive, representing the structure of the, so the atomic structure. So, and that was a pure point measure. And you had the Fourier transform, which was also a pure point measure. So that, that's the kind of objects we, we want to understand. So we know it's a pure point, and from, at least from the mathematical point of view, from, especially from the input of number theory, uh, this what I'm going to define here is, is important. So it's the kind of objects we will be looking at for applications later on. So a crystalline measure, mu, uh, we say that uh, mu is a crystalline measure, um, is, uh, is defined by the following conditions. Uh, uh, one, uh, mu is pure point. And if you look at the support of mu, uh, so this will be, uh, by being pure point, it means, as I said, uh, it's a sum of delta masses over some innumerable set. Okay, so the support would be this uh, set, which is enumerable. And I'm going to ask that this set here is actually locally finite. And support of mu is locally finite. Okay, not to confuse with locally summable, uh, but locally finite, what, what is a locally finite set? I can put a little box here a set in the real line is locally finite if for every A, well, not every A, say every T positive, this is finite. Okay? Uh, another name for this is discrete and closed, for instance. But it's just isolated points. So in every bounded region of the space, you have only finitely many points. But that's what I'm asking here, so crystalline. Okay? So that would represent the structure of the, say, the atomic structure of the, the crystal you want to study. Um, but crystalline asks even more. Uh, the Fourier transform has the same structure. It's pure point and support of mu hat, which we often call this the spectrum. We often call this the spectrum. Uh, is locally finite. Okay, so that would be a crystalline measure. You might complain now and say, well, I don't know how to compute Fourier transform of an arbitrary measure, okay? It might not be all defined. So I have to say something more. Then here, I'm going to ask that mu 
is strongly tempered. What is strongly tempered? It means that if you take the Schwarz function, this is the same to say, is contained in L1 of the total variation of the measure, which means you can integrate Schwarz functions. Okay? Exercise. This is the same to say that the total variation integrates a polynomial. Okay? So there exists n in z such that the degree of mu, I will already make a definition here, is the minimum, um, let's see, let me write this way, the, um, the degree of mu which the minimum of the n's in z, such that the integral of uh, this number here is less than infinity. To define the degree of a measure, the smallest integer, such that this holds. Okay. In particular, I'll be interested in measures whose degree is less or equal than two. Okay. So I have to ask that, why? Because then, if mu is like this, then mu, by this exercise, defines a temperate distribution. And then I can compute for here to inform of a temperate distribution. So I can compute this. So this is a temperate distribution. And what I'm claiming is that it identifies with a pure point uh, a measure, say, and whose support is locally finite. Okay. And then you can also complain, well, what do you mean by identifying? So say when you restrict to, say, say infinity of a compact support functions, then integrating this against the Fourier transform is the same as making a sum. Okay. <coughs> if you go to in the literature, you will see that uh, this crystalline measure business is, uh, is um, defining things like this. It's complicated because um, the authors that call this quasi-crystal, the others Fourier quasi-crystal, Order calls it uh, um, doubly sparse, and so on. There is no agreement on the definition, and it changes if you change the K conditions and etc. Uh, it's a bit of a uh, of a mess here. But uh, this is the definition of Yves Meyer. So I'll keep this. Yeah. So tempered would be uh, maybe I should so. Mu hat is tempered. So what's tempered, maybe I should define this as well. <clears throat> so a measure nu is tempered if there exists a, a tempered distribution, which I'll call u, such that u evaluated at some test function phi equals the integral of phi with the nu for every phi c infinity of compact support. OK, so that's tempered. OK. So there is the exercise of showing that these two definitions are not the same. Strongly tempered, that is asking this, is not the same as asking that it's tempered. Okay. Okay. 
now. Yes, uh, the idea is to give some, uh, to give a bunch of examples at the end of the, the third talk. Yes, uh, but there are a bunch of them. Um, the problem of being explicit examples, that's a different question. I know a few, but, uh, um, but there are way more examples that I can actually write analytically. Let's see. Point. Yeah. Okay, so now I have I can define the thing that I wanted in the first place. So definition. So now I want to study what kind of Poisson summations are there. So I have to make a definition. Um, so I want I want to generalize the concept of Poisson summation. So remember, a Poisson summation, maybe you can write here. What's the Poisson summation formula? Well, it's, there are two ways of uh, looking at this. The first is uh, from the measure a theoretical point of view, which would be you make this sum. So this is a, a, a measure, pure point, actually locally finite uh, uh, support. You can compute its Fourier transform, and you can show it equals itself. OK? And then that is from the distribution of point of view. But if you just want an identity, that would be the identity you're looking for for every phi is a test function. And for me, whenever I say test function, I mean uh, C infinity with compact support. OK. Uh, so I think, in, in, at least in applications in number theory, people like love formulas. They don't think too much this way, like via explicit formula or the prime number or a theorem, like explicit formula, things like that. So in number theory, we like formulas rather than uh, playing with measures, uh, at least in analytic number theory. Um, but in any case, so you, you, you can think in both ways. So what's the idea? The idea is now to define a concept, which I will call uh, a Fourier summation pair, that would in some way be uh, the most general version you can think of about something like that. So I don't want to define a, a, a general Poisson summation type formula. Uh, it can't be too general, for instance, because you have Fourier multiplication. So, so a Poisson summation formula should be equivalent to an identity like that. So if I just take, say, an L1 function, mu, suppose it's like an L1 function, OK? Uh, and let me call it some other name, F. Uh, then I could just do that. Uh, just use, uh, if we have transform, it has this property. And I could say that here is a Poisson summation formula. I have integration with, against phi hat on one side, and integration with phi on the other side. And this works for every test function. Uh, perhaps I should put, uh, uh, yeah, it should, should be fine. And so this works for every test function. So it, I don't want to classify this as a generalized Poisson summation formula. I want something. I want something that shows up as a sum somewhere. And this sum has to be singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And so I would define it this way. So mu a is a Fourier summation pair um, if mu is uh, strongly tempered measure A is a locally summable function.
and you have the identity. Integral of phi of t, the mu of t, phi hat equals the sum of a lambda, phi lambda, for every phi test function. So you integrate on one side for against the measure, I don't care. And as long as the right hand side is singular. So maybe an alternative definition is just that mu is a strongly tempered measure and its Fourier transform is pure point. Okay. Uh, once you restrict, once you look at it uh, and as a distribution and restrict to the uh, to the test function. So that would be a sort of a distributional uh, point of view. But I prefer to keep it this way. I prefer to do with uh, identities rather than uh, the distributional side. Uh, and in a way, this is the, the minimal requirements. Well, I want this to summate, okay? The function is locally summable. So as long as this is compactly supported, the sum is gonna be defined. And plus, I want to integrate this against any Schwartz function which means exactly this, in a way. So I have to ask that. OK. And so what the result I'm going to present, I'm going to classify. I'm, I will try to present this result. But when you classify all Fourier summation pairs, anything that is this, this type, you classify it completely. Like you have to assume that the degree of mu is bounded. I mean, I'm working on trying to remove this condition, but it, if the measure is positive, for instance, which is the interesting case from the physics side, you, you can drop that condition anyways. Okay, so Poisson summation is an example. Let me do one thing, and then uh, let me try to prove Poisson summation in a way that I think you didn't know. Okay. So one way that people usually prove Poisson summation is you give a little bit of theory of Fourier series, and then you go ahead and prove it. Okay. But what about this um, this guy here? So Ginnon. in uh, 1959, came up with this formula. Uh, define this measure here. There will be some coefficients. Let me call it p. And there will be deltas at n plus 1 over 9. It will be a symmetric measure, so n greater or equal uh, than um, 0. And then he shows that mu hat equals itself, and the coefficients b let me just give a few of them so you don't think I'm crazy. Um, If you you can guess more or less where these coefficients are coming from, at least uh, Guilherme should guess at least where these coefficients uh, sort of are coming from. Okay, it will be rational numbers. Okay, always uh, they will come from uh, some model of form of weight a half. Okay. I will try to explain a little bit, I think, in the, in the next lecture. Okay. So, again, I come up with this, this nice construction. And for. Yes. 
He, it's worse than that. He claims that he took this formula from a book of Landau from 1909. Landau. Yeah, Landau, yes. Oh, okay. yeah. And if you go in his book, then I, I think he claimed that he learned from somebody else, something like that. It, it, go, it goes way back. Okay. Um, he didn't wrote it as a model of form, by the way. He wrote it in some other, yeah. He used Poisson summation in a clever way to prove this. Uh, so he he didn't have this baggage. Um, yeah. But you can reinterpret as. Uh, uh, so what you can do is, is well, uh, since you asked, I can even state the theorem. So what you can do is this, for every c greater or equal than 0 real, you can come up, come up with the measure mu of c. Uh, and this will be a delta at square root of n plus c plus delta minus square root of n plus c. Okay, you can come up with a measure like that um, for some coefficients, um, and its full here transform is going to be equal to itself. Okay, and the measure the measure will be built in such a way that when c equals zero, what you get is Poisson summation, classical one, and when c equals One over nine, you get Guinan. Okay, so you can interpolate. So you can go from this guy to that guy, sort of a one-parameter family interpolation. Okay. Uh, and I think I have it here. Let me see. Yes, I should have it. And this would be given by this guy here. If you let c equals, uh, if you let l equals 24c minus 2, yes, then, um, let me write it here. l equals 24c minus 2. Um, you can write this guy here. It comes from what's called an uh, uh, eta product. Okay, you get Dedekind's eta function. Uh, you write this function. This function will have an expansion in Q series. Let me erase this. Which is going to be uh, QL plus 2 over, over 24, 1 minus LQ plus L minus 1, 2 plus L divided by 2, Q squared plus dot, 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 uh, where the Dedekind zeta function is this guy. And uh, Q is e2 pi i z. Okay. So, so yeah. So the data king of eta function has an expansion as a power series of Q. Uh, you just write what that expansion is, and then you take the coefficients. This this b n s here. This would be the b n c. These coefficients here. And you can show that this measure is self-dual, okay? And you can show that it's strongly tempered as well, okay? And to prove this is a to totally different proof from that one, uh, from the Fourier series uh, point of view. Uh, so you have to come up with different methods. Um, so that's Dedekind's data function. By the way, I should say, in 2018, uh, is a friend of mine, and, uh, and we, we try to work together on certain things. Called, uh, 
His name is Danilo Hadchenko. Uh, he gave a seminar in 2018 in Bonn, presenting a construction which was similar to this one. I can't remember exactly what he presented, but he had some of the ingredients. But he never published, okay, for some reason. And so, since I, I haven't heard back from him yet, uh, so I think it, it's sort of a similar, okay. So I can't say it's entirely my my construction. So let's put it this way: you have to give credit. Uh, but I don't. He, his purpose was something else, okay. But I think as uh, maybe as a byproduct, he had something similar. Okay, so this is here. Okay, so let me try to give um, let me try to give a proof of the Poisson summation, which is sort of a, in a way that it's a sort of a toy version of the proof of the main result I want to present. Okay, so I'm going to sort of a try to uh, uh, um, restrict, uh, sort of, what's the word that I'm looking for? Sort of uh, specify uh, the proof I have for this general result to the Poisson uh, summation case. So in order to sort of uh, 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 exemplify how things uh, might go. Okay, so let me try to do that. But, but as you can see, just to finish a comment in that thing, uh, uh, the theory of uh, Fourier summation formulas like that, especially in the case of locally, especially in the, the case of crystalline measures. So that, for instance, that guy is a crystalline measure. No? The, Fourier uh, uh, the measure is Fourier transform, uh, sums of deltas, and there is, uh, and over a locally finite set. They don't have the same property that the Fourier, um, uh, that the Poisson summation has, because these points, uh, so here you have the integer, so the distance between consecutive points is one, for instance, in particular, the, the points are not getting closer together, but these points are getting closer and closer together. The square root of n minus, so the square root of n plus one over nine, uh, minus square root of n minus 1 plus 1 over 9, this is going to 0. Actually, it's like, it's going to 0 like 1 over square root of n. So the points are getting closer together as you go far away, not with Poisson summation. So it's, it's, it's sort of a, the set, the supporting set is locally finite, but it's, there is a, this crucial difference that they're getting, the points are getting closer together. You might ask the following question. Well, this guy here still contains a set which is separated. For instance, if you take m equals 9m squared plus 2m. So if you take n, sorry. That's an integer, so I can take it. If I put in here, I can complete squares. Then what you get, if I just add 1 over 9, this is 3m plus 1 third squared. Okay? And so I can take square root. And this would be a, a arithmetic progression. So the support here contains an infinite arithmetic progression because I can put any m integer. Okay? It is not the case for this generalization, because you can put any real. Okay, so then you can show that if this support here intersects, suppose that it contains an infinite arithmetic progression, or even more, suppose it intersects some infinite arithmetic progression in more than five points. Sorry, more than four points. Then C must be rational. Because, well, you can just uh, unpack everything, sort of uh, take squares, etc., and you can show that C is rational. Okay, and it's, it's sort of a 
the idea comes from like trying to complete squares and so on. And so it can only hit an infinite arithmetic progression in four points, which means that when you created something even better, right? when c is irrational, say c equals pi, for instance. Um, uh, so this set is even more complicated. Not only points are getting closer, but it's not, it, it is not contained in an infinite, say it's not contained in a finite union of infinite arithmetic progressions. So it's sort of a very non-periodic. Okay. And this is sort of a question that people ask in the field, like can we create, like how crazy can we create measures like this? With, uh, can, how crazy can we create crystalline uh, measures? Uh, and then people are interested in things like, well, can we create some of these guys such that uh, the support is not contained in some uh, finite union of periodic sets, like infinite arithmetic progressions? And you can sort of uh, go back to 1959 really understand what Guinan was doing, and you can, you can get it, okay? It's not the first time that people had to really read Guinan's paper to understand something. There is a paper, Yves Meyer, which is sort of a, sort of a calling the field to pay attention on the paper. <laughs> uh, uh, Okay, so let's try to prove Poisson's summation. So, so the first thing we need is a lemma. So, so I will denote, so C plus, we denote the upper half plane. Okay. Um, and I will often write Z as a complex variable, or sometimes W as a complex variable. So, for W and Z in the upper half plane, let G W Z X to be E minus two pi I moduli of X, indicator when X is negative. So it's one when X is negative, zero when it's greater than zero. Two pi I Z norm of X, x greater or equal than zero. And I'm going to divide this just to normalize by z minus w bar. Okay. Then so this is a calculation, uh, but in a way, is the essence of the proof. Okay, um, and here I must say that I'm using Fourier transform. I didn't say it, but I have to say that's the definition of Fourier transform I'm using. Okay, the Stein's definition. Stein loves this definition. If if we go to other areas, like uh, especially in uh, some papers in physics and sometimes in some time frequency analysis, but from the approximation theory uh, side of it, uh, people don't like to use 2 pi here. They just put i. Yeah. But anyways. Okay, so you have this. So this proof exercise, okay. Yeah, put this proof, uh, put this in a test here at IMPA, and nobody was able to do it. I was very depressed after that.
OK. So let's try the proof. Uh, so it starts with Hadamard factorization of the sine function. OK. That's Hadamard factorization of the sine function. Sine of pi z equals that. OK. So why do you have this thing? Well, first of all, uh, sine, I, the way you show it, a sine of pi z is an entire function. It has finite order. It has order 1. So you already know that you can write something like that, uh, perhaps with some exponentials here. But since the 0 is isometric, the, these exponentials go away. Okay? There should be a, an exponential of a linear polynomial here at the front, perhaps. Uh, you can show that that thing vanishes as well. Okay. Then what you do, you take log derivative. So you get cosine of pi z, sine of pi z, after rearranging some terms. OK. Then what you do, you're going to do something which, if you don't see this lemma, would be crazy. But if you do know some other things, it would be natural. And so what you're going to do is this. Well, at least for me, it was natural to do it. Oh, this is W. And at least I'm going to do bar. OK? You have to understand this sum is a symmetric sum, by the way. Otherwise, it doesn't converge. It's, it, this is the limit of the symmetric sum. But if you do this, it's much better, because now you don't need to think about that. You can just close your eyes and do it. That's what you get. See if everything looks not crazy. Oh, you, you don't get, you get with the minus here, sorry. Um, yeah, you get with the minus here because uh, the W bar is going to be on the front, not Z. So you get the minus. Okay, so to make things right, what you do is you multiply by I over 2, everything. OK? And then you get the 2 pi i here. Now, what a remarkable thing. The right-hand side is just the Fourier transform of this function. OK? So you can write uh, sum and g hat w. C N. Okay. Well, if I wanted to prove Poisson summation, uh, it should definitely work. This is a very nice function. Eh? So if you if you plot this function here, uh, it's continuous, and it's something like that. It behaves like an exponential here. Behaves like another exponential here. I mean, imagining that, uh, say, w and z are purely imaginary, then this function would be real if you cut the i that you had, would have here, and you could plot it. Or you can plot the absolute value, if you like. Uh, so the absolute value of the function would behave something like this. It would decay like exponential here, decay like another exponential here, and at the origin would be 1 over divided by this number. Okay? So it's a very nice function. So Poisson summation should work for that guy. Okay. And we just had the, the, the left-hand side here. So let's try to prove if I can manipulate this side to get summation of a g over n. Okay. And that, again, is uh, something we can do. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is not my invention. Huh? This proof of 
kind of proof of Poisson summation. I mean, the proof of this formula people knew before. Um, uh, the idea that this is equivalent to Poisson summation maybe is not so uh, mainstream, uh, but it is. Uh, so what you can do is now is uh, well, what is this? I just write it in exponentials. I had to divide this by 2i, and this guy I should divide by 2. The 2s would cancel, but there was still remaining like divided by i here. OK. Uh, but then what happens? This i multiplies with that i, I get a minus a half, which means I can just flip this guy. So this calculation would be rearranging everything. It would be this. Now I can isolate the, the, the guy with the minus. Oh, I forget the what the half here. There's a half here. I can isolate the guy with the minus and do this. One plus e two pi i z divided one minus e two pi i z. What's good about this is that z, uh, so let's uh, now take z and w only on the upper half plane. OK? So now z is on the upper half plane. This guy has norm less than 1. It can expand in power series. If you just do it, what you get is a half plus um, n greater or equal than 1, 2 pi i on z. OK? Now, you see what you have. What do you have? You have this minus i over 2 bar of this guy, which is the same thing as just adding the bar of everything. Well, that function, if you call function f, if you call this f, this uh, thing here is in the form f of z plus f of w bar divided by z minus w bar. OK? If you see this and you have worked on uh, especially on uh, uh, spaces of analytic functions, operator theory, and et cetera. You look at this, you see a kernel of some uh, Hilbert space. Okay. Indeed, if time permitting, I would try to write, a, say, a Hilbert space interpretation of FS pairs. You can, you can make something like that. It's just because you, you see this kernel. Okay. So, you can interpret this as a kernel. But in any case, if you just write that f like that, you just have this, OK? And then you just have to do the computation. Well, f of z is like that. Then I just add f of w bar and see what I get, OK? And I will leave you to do this computation. It will be exactly that thing. It will match exactly with that formula. And so you just proved Poisson summation for the function GWZ for any W and Z in the upper half point. OK? And then exercise, finish it. OK? So you can show. So how do you do it? So exercise, finish the proof. So I'll even make it easier for you. So if V is test, then And the only thing you have to notice is that if I do g of g hat of um, i y, sorry, 
it, sh it should be g of z plus s, I think it's z minus z bar plus s c. This is the guy. You can just do it in your head, but uh, I want to uh, be quick and copy. so quick then uh, yeah here uh, it should be if you do this um, let's see if I do this what happens if I do this if I put I should do just the computation. It's going to be better. Um, I have C minus uh, S minus Z. And then the other one is going to be C minus W bar. So you're going to take this bar and subtract. So minus, minus Z bar plus S bar. Okay, so the bar gets in, so it's plus z minus s. Uh, did I write this? C minus s. Yes, so I write it as c minus s. Uh, plus z. Okay? So then it's going to be c minus s squared minus z squared. Okay, let me just write that. It's too low. Let me erase this picture here at the top. So it's going to be what? 1 over 2 pi i c minus s squared minus z squared. Okay. In particular, if you take z equals i i, and it, by the way, I can take minus z bar here because if z is on the upper half plane, minus z bar is also in the upper half plane. In a, in, yeah. Anyways, uh, and, and if I translate by a real variable, is also in the upper half plane. So if I take z equals e y, but for y positive, uh, it's going to be plus y squared, OK? So if I take that guy and multiply by y, you get Poisson, Poisson kernel, OK? And so you can make this uh, um, the Poisson kernel. In particular, if you put z equals i, y, and w equals z, you're going to get the i, y here. So you can sort of multiply both sides by y. And so what, what I'm saying is that you can make Poisson kernel showing up here. And so what you can do is a sort of a convolve the right-hand side or integrate against the function. And you get the convolution and you just do approximation of identity, send y to 0, and get this formula. So this, this is uh, the hint for the, for the thing. But it's very convenient to do this, to do this kernel. Okay? Avoids a bunch of, a bunch of uh, mess that sh could arise if you didn't do it. Okay, how much time I have? Huh? Open ended? <laughs> let me, uh, let me, um, uh, probably like 15 minutes maybe. Huh? 15 minutes. So let's, uh, let's not push as well. So last talk was one hour and 10. So let's, let's do the same, one hour and 10. So let's, uh, so in the last uh, 14 minutes, let's try to do, uh, so, okay, so, so a remark. The first remark is that I want to state a theorem that uh, where in somehow I can make a glorified version of this proof to the infinity 
So when I reach there, I can come back. So I want to get an if and only if and in the end. If I have an FS pair, I have something happening. If there's something happening, it's happening, I have an FS pair. So whenever you have those things you want to prove, you just generalize up to infinity and you hope that you can come back. It's usually the case. So what are the ingredients we had here? Let's try to identify them. Okay. So first thing, if I call, if I multiply by, say, so in the end I multiply this guy by i over 2. So suppose I multiply this by i over 2. This is i over 2. So what I can do is, is if I sum it over the integers, put a minus here plus doesn't make any difference. So let's do that. If I put the i below, um, I multiply this. No, let's keep that the way it was. I multiply this by minus. So I think in the end you get this. Okay, so if that was a function f. Okay, so what's the ingredient? I should have a function f where a representation like this is available. Okay, so if you know Poisson's representation of functions, that's what you want. So first ingredient, Uh, first is Poisson representation. Okay, so you would like that f of z, remember that this is the left hand side. Okay, so I could write this as the integral of if mu was the sum of deltas at the integers, okay? If, if you know a bit of Poisson representation, you don't get exactly this. And so what I would like to have is, because uh, the measures can only be integrable against one over t squared, so that's not exactly what I want. So uh, I will show later that you can make this, uh, it should be fine. What you want is something as Poisson representation, so I think it's, there, there's some ways of writing this. So I want a representation like that. Why? Because this thing here you, is just one over t minus z minus t one plus t squared, okay? Why do I want to do that? because, well, you have the t minus z that comes from there, and the other part, I don't really care because it's just an integration against a measure, okay? I'm, I'm gonna show that you can always assume the measure is real, by the way. So it's integrating something with a real thing with an imaginary bit, okay? And this imaginary bit won't, care, won't matter, okay? So I, I can allow myself to remove such a term so to make the integral converge, okay? Yeah. So, for instance, here, if mu was this sum of deltas, like in Poisson summation, this would only make sense if I made this, uh, the integral uh, symmetric. Yeah, but I want to avoid doing this because I I'm going to work with the, any measure. The measure could be any real value. So I don't know if it's symmetric or not. Okay. So the first thing is Poisson representation. I want to know exactly the conditions when I can have a representation like that. And that should be enough. And the second, the second came from this bit. Okay, so what is this bit? So you, take, you took F, you wrote this, which I call the kernel. You wrote this kernel here. And for some reason, this guy was a sum like that. What's the sum like that? Well, g is like this. So, it will, so if you imagine that this was the a part, so remember that in, for our fs pair, 
we had integral of phi hat the mu, and you had sum of phi lambda. So we dealt with this part here. Now we want to deal with this. Okay, and this came from this kernel, and this uh, for with, uh, and for some reason was equal to an identity over sum of this function here. So notice that they have things which are positive, things which are negative. And so, um, well, how, how can I come up with something like that? Okay, because the right-hand side should be, I should write in red as well, should be sort of a, well, this right-hand side should be sort of a, a summation of lambda real a lambda g of w z lambda. That is what I should get. Okay. okay so if I get this, um, so if I get that this thing is equals that, and f has the representation, notice if f has this representation, when I write the kernel, here, look, I make a summation with the conjugate. So remember that this guy was uh, 1 over tz minus t over 1 plus t squared. So, and this, I, I said, that you can assume mu is real. So mu integrated against this just with an imaginary guy. It sort of adds an imaginary constant. But that guy goes away when you do that. OK? And so you're going to get, if you have this, and you have something like that. So the second uh, thing is, which I will write, it's almost periodicity. And that's going to translate to us into the following. And when a function that also has an identity like that. Let me write with this one. Okay. With G, that guy there. And this sort of will translate to almost periodicity. So this will sort of a translate of asking that F is almost periodic. OK. So that's the essence of the result. Uh, the result should be, in some way, that for every fs pair, you can associate a function f almost periodic. This function will have some properties. And then converse would be. Suppose you give me a function, which are almost periodic, and satisfy some properties. Then from that guy, a Fourier summation pair comes out. Okay. So it's going to be an if and only if. Huh? And you see that there is no assumption at all in anything. Essentially, if this is a measure, could you have even an absolute continuous part? And the right hand side is a sum. But other than this, that these are the only conditions. And it was, to my surprise as well, that you can classify those when the measure has degree less or equal than 2, or when the measure is positive, then you can drop that condition. OK? So, to, and if you go to my first lecture and read the result that, I, that is on YouTube, if you read the, first, the last slide, I guess, you will see that essentially what you have is this description. And so this is the proof, essentially. Okay, so in the next, uh, in the next uh, lecture, what I would try to do is uh, start it defining what an almost periodic function is, tell some properties, the, then I'm going to go to Poisson representation, how can you, uh, what are the conditions for Poisson representation, and then finally give an idea of, state the result, give an idea, and then uh, Probably it's going to be more than one hour and 10 minutes, maybe one hour and 20. Uh, then try to uh, give some of the applications. Okay. Um, 
and then maybe write a bunch of examples. Okay. You already wrote two examples. Um, Oh yes, I forgot. There is a final remark here. So when 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 you work on formulas like that, especially that live over the square roots of some arithmetic progression, you unavoidably are living in the world of uh, modular forms of weight a half. Okay, there's a very natural way of looking at these things uh, like that. And essentially, is uh, whenever you have a modular form of weight a half. Uh, uh, it's holomorphic at infinity. Um, uh, you, from that, you, you have to assume, yes, you, you would have to assume that you can apply the transformation S and you get another modular form. Um, um, uh, but in any case, uh, under some mild conditions, you can attach a, a measure like that. And that measure will satisfy this property. In a, in, in, in a way, this thing would be equivalent to the uh, transformation rules, okay? So, uh, and as a side comment, uh, this, this uh, interpretation, these things uh, came especially after people were paying attention on this thing, especially after the works of, of Vyazovska, uh, the solution of the sphere packet problem, okay? So it's, that thing is, that part of the story is really connected to packings and et cetera, and what the, people call now Fourier interpolation formulas. Okay, if I have time, I will present it. Um, probably I won't. Um, okay, so I think we can stop here. Thank you.